Hi, I'm Leslie Carroll Roberts, Chair of the MFA Writing Program here at California College of the Arts in San Francisco, and we're going to be talking to you today about the Ecopoiesis Project. We are coming to you live from the writing studio at California College of the Arts in San Francisco, and let's get going here. So, um, for my own work um, includes two books, The Entire Earth and Sky, Views on Antarctica, and my 2019 eco-memoir, Here's Where I Walk, Episodes from a Life in the Forest. And um, I, the eco-memoir traces about a dozen or so years of walks I've taken in a national park where I live, which is called the Presidio National Park, as well as sites around the world. Uh, I'm joined here today for this uh, discussion by um, Professor Adam Marcus, who is a professor of architecture here at CCA and a principal in the architecture studio Variable pro uh, Projects. And Adam is also director of the Architectural Ecologies Lab, which is an experimental research group exploring the intersections between architecture and science. Um, I'm also joined today by Chris Falliers, who's professor of architecture at CCA, and he's the principal of, I of Ideal X, a design practice focusing on public architecture, public art, and community engagement. So we want to begin by thanking our hosts, the UC Santa Barbara Environmental Humanities Center for hosting Next Earth, teaching climate change across the disciplines. And we very much appreciate this format where we're not burning any carbon to get to you. And we're very grateful for this opportunity. The Ecopoiesis Project is a multi-year cycle of spring symposia and workshops, followed by a fall publication of the collaborative output, uh, uh, output in 1111, CCA's literary journal. The inaugural workshop took place in April of this year and included 34 uh, participants from across the disciplines, art, design, science, policy, and philosophy. The event was framed around the work of ecological ph philosopher Timothy Morton and concluded with a keynote by Tim discussing his work and the output of the workshop. So from the outset of this collaboration, um, between CCA's MFA writing program and the Architectural Ecologies Lab, uh, we knew we wanted Ecopoesis to serve as a platform for interdisciplinary discussion of ecologies, both as form and language, uh, and while also developing creative and flexible formats of dialogue and learning. One important note in all this is that at the beginning, we knew more about what we did not want it to be. And we did not want it to be a stand and deliver conference. And we did not want it to be larger than 35 people. And you'll see more of that as Chris and Adam explain uh, how the, the symposium came together. I want to begin um, with how this project came together initially. Uh, in June of 2018, I called Adam and who's you know my colleague here at CCA and I asked him if he wanted to imagine some sort of collaborative writing and making with scholars and practitioners across disciplines you know from the arts to national park management from speculative design to writing and then in August we knew we needed um, a, another another voice and so we invited Chris who's also our colleague to uh, join as well and we started working on this in earnest in August and uh, I did want to note this was um, a, a beautiful collaboration and um, extraordinarily time-consuming and we'll talk about that a little bit more at the end. Um, so what is ecopoiesis as we're defining it here? Um, before answering this question, I want to briefly consider the meaning of ecology, a word that first appeared um, in the 1866 General Morphology of Organisms written by Ernst Haeckel. Um, he was a Prussian naturalist, and this book was a global bestseller. It was incredibly influential. Um, and it's interesting to note that then, like today, there was a push to create more precise um, words for emergent understandings of how the earth functions as an, an ecosystem. So how then, you know, how then are we defining this ecopoesis project? Um, let, me, let me first point to uh, this sort of sense of, of tribute we have to our lineage, which is the practice of ecological storytelling by writers, designers, and artists producing texts, objects, and speculative representations, often towards a polemic, and often in isolation by discipline. The history of ecological storytelling, from Paleolithic cave paintings to utopian promises and dystopian warnings, illustrates an evolving sense of human relational identity to nature. 
As our everyday lives are increasingly suffused by the impacts of climate change and climate chaos, Ecopoesis argues we must craft new narratives, we must reframe the narratives so that we can understand and access the language, syntax, diction, form, media, and representation of ecologies. So we started by making a list, of, a wish list of participants. Most we were drawing from the larger Bay Area, but some came from as far away as New York. And then we sent out personal formal invitations um, about four months before the actual symposium. And we detailed what the two day gathering would be. And we also used this as a chance to d define for everybody how intentional this community intended to be and to get them set with their homework. We wanted to give everybody a lot of run up time to get the readings done. Each participant was then given a portion of Tim's dark ecology to read in advance, as well as the design brief for the workshop. Tim, who's on the faculty now at Rice University, was a perfect fit for our emergent model for ecopoesis. His own practice includes collaboration with Bjork and collaborations with the artist Justin Bryce Gorilla, among many others. And he has a connection to our college CCA. When he was a faculty member at UC Davis, which is, as you know, not, not far from where we are, um, I had invited him in 2011 to give a lecture uh, that ultimately became part of his book on, on hyperobjects. So CCA held a very special place for him and um, we, you know, we have a lot of a sort of an innate warmth and familiarity with his big brain because of that and that vibe translated to the eco Poesis project itself. It was very important. So this paper we're presenting today presents uh, our first curricular initiative, there are going to be three of them, exploring shifting philosophical and ontological context in the sixth mass extinction, and how we explored ecological storytelling at the intersection of the arts, humanities, and design. The goal was to generate humanistic knowledge, new narratives, and interdisciplinary forms of practice and pedagogy with Tim's work as instigator. Adam? So as we carefully assembled the cohort of designers, writers, makers, and thinkers that would participate in the April workshop, it was important to us that we included a diversity of perspectives, disciplines, and skill sets. And you see the names of, of the folks who participated um, in the workshop um, last month um, on this slide. We also wanted to make sure that the workshop did not remain entirely within the academy, either as an internal colloquium among our own like-minded colleagues or as a purely academic exercise whose impact would remain inside the institution. Mm -hmm. The group of 34 participants consisted of about one-third CCA faculty, one-third CCA graduate students, and one-third outside experts representing a range of fields and areas of expertise. These included academics from all four divisions in CCA, architecture, design, fine arts, and humanities and sciences, as well as representatives from worlds of technology, public policy, culture, and publishing. Um, coming from places like San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, um, the Golden Gate National Parks Conservancy, University of California, Berkeley, University of California, Davis, and so on. Um, student participants included candidates from both our Master of Architecture program and our Master of Fine Arts program. In thinking about how to structure the workshop, we decided to frame the conversation with a set of prompts for the participants. The first prompt was to offer a set of words that are commonly associated with contemporary debates about ecology and how to respond to climate change. Part of the motivation here was a recognition that as words like sustainability and resilience have become so ubiquitous, they really are no longer that effective in articulating coherent responses to ecological change. But the broader intent was to instill an ethos of ecological storytelling by organizing ourselves around specific selected words that are associated with conversations about the sixth mass extinction. So we began by looking at re-words, words that begin with the prefix re that offer us different ways to think about the issues at hand. We ultimately settled on the three words retreat, remain, and resist as presenting three different vectors for considering humanity's role and agency in a time of ecological uncertainty. We organized the workshop participants into three working groups aligned with these words and asked them to consider the prefix re, which means again or back, and how actions of environmental engagement can be both forward thinking and second acts. 
We ask them to think about these words as both human and non-human positional actions related to environmental change. So for example, um, consider the phrase, a glacier retreats, versus the phrase, we construct retreats. Mm -hmm. Parallel to this interest in words, which are the primary media for writers, we were also interested in images, which are the primary media for architects and designers. Towards this end, we were interested in having the workshop produce a kind of collective visual artifact, a drawing, a collage, or other sort of construct that would be the collaborative product of each working, working group. We looked at a number of precedents of this kind of collective endeavor, from the collaborative large-scale drawings of German design group Ramlabor on the left, um, to the recent installation This Land by artist David Opdyke, which you see on the right. We returned again and again to this project in particular as a haunting and compelling work of environmental messaging. The artwork tiles together 528 altered drawings of U.S. landmarks into a scene of ecological havoc and crisis, filtered through the nostalgic imagery of vintage postcards. It operates simultaneously at multiple scales and uses images to produce a variety of possible readings. In the context of the Ecopoesis workshop, we were interested in how a collectively produced scene like this could take on this kind of per perceptual multiplicity and similarly experiment with representations of landscape as sites of contemplation, critique, and communication about the state of environment. So to kick off the workshop, we shared some of these precedents and issued a short brief. To read uh, from the brief, from contemplation to advocacy, the symposium workshop asks attendees to explore how systems of language, making, and representation engage emerging ecological change. It asks participants to collaborate on a collective work, both as a vehicle for internal dialogue and outcome for external communication. Attendees are asked to engage the following experiment, the production of an incomplete environmental scene developed as a compelling communication slash position on a contemporary ecological situation. In short, we ask each group to produce a collective message. One of the critical challenges in framing this brief was how to strike a balance between leaving the exercise entirely open-ended or providing a prescribed structure and outcome to the workshop. How much did we want to control the flow of the workshop and the nature of the outcomes? Are we producing outputs or are we producing dialogues? And what kind of process is most suitable or appropriate for a dialogue of such political and philosophical complexity? The architects in our team, me and Chris, are accustomed to highly prescribed pedagogies that are common in a curriculum that's largely driven by professional standards. While the writer, Leslie, is much more comfortable with open-ended experiments. But an interesting and unexpected outcome of this workshop was how our views collectively have shifted in regard to this spectrum, and with both the architects and the writer recognizing the value of both open-ended and prescriptive workflows. Woven into the pedagogical structure of the workshop was a series of three communal meals prepared by the workshop organizers, ourselves, and served in CCA's writer studio and garden, the same location for the workshop and where we, we sit right now. The kickoff dinner was an opportunity for the participants to meet one another and for the chairs to introduce the brief for the workshop the following day. We found the meals to be a pivotal part of uh, the event, provided, providing moments for the participants to pause their work and socialize with one another. We found that home-cooked food, in addition to minimizing food waste, plastics, and emissions from delivery, contributed to a much more collective and intimate atmosphere than typically encountered at academic symposia. The workshop concluded in late afternoon and was followed by a closing keynote by Timothy Morton. As Leslie mentioned, Morton's presence was critical not only for the importance and relevance of his work in ecologies, but we found it enormously productive to have a central figure whose work could serve as a touchstone for the workshop participants to engage with and respond to. The keynote was open to the broader public and attracted a diverse audience of 300 from across the Bay Area. Let me introduce my colleague, Chris Folliers, uh, who will go into more detail on the workshop process and outcomes. Reporting on the workshop and symposium, we discussed how to bring together a disparate group of people in a short period of time. The primary concern was how to organize a structure to 
to explore language and visual images in a way that stresses multiplicity and collectivity of view and meanings. We learned from Wallace Stevens. We discussed the importance of multiple voices, multiple points of view, and a multiplicity of descriptions as important to convey the essence of any environmental subject. To initiate connectivity and collectivity among the attendees, the collective vocabulary was a shared Google file, an open reservoir, or even an atlas, in which multiple terms were brought forward by the attendees before and during the symposium. This open format or forum continues as a living document. A very noticeable aspect was how the evolution of language, its terms and meanings, reflects the changing relationships to environment. Between Shelley's awe of glacier and Professor Rob Nixon's positing that glacial, as in glacial pace, needs to be decommissioned, the term glacial or glacier has transformed from a notion of to the sublime to a description of slowness to now a signifier of impending catastrophe. We see this taken up by the workshop attendees, where a careful message was developed over the course of the day. In this case, very simply, all our actions mark this world. In parallel, we highlighted the use of pertinent images, often iconic, sometimes never seen before, and their history of influence within communications and conversations about environmental, environmental advocacy. As an example, Stuart Brand had to work diligently to have the US government release the first whole Earth image and have it released to the public. Brand continued to use these images as icons, messaging through dissemination of this imagery through mass media. Environmental logos were discussed as both influential and limiting. For example, the Recycle logo, developed through a competition in sync with Earth Day 1970, has ubiquitous reach. However, current research shows that com consumer confusion remains on what and how to recycle and the impact of these secondary consumer goods systems. We asked attendees to consider subjects which represent the current era. Plastic conglomerates, for instance, represent an early artifact from the Anthropocene, one quote-unquote co-produced by human and environmental systems. We introduced historic representations of social environmental worlds as vehicles for social critique. For instance, Bruegel the El Elder's Tower of Babel was commissioned and originally displayed in Antwerp by a financial leader. The painting was used to foster a convivium, a, a learned dinner conversation about the current state of the 16th century city. Thomas Cole's critique of the process of civilization in Course of Empire used the representation of environment to read symbols of civilization against and as active, active visual elements changing relative to these stages of civilization. We argued for the importance of representations of environment in which environment itself, not the human, is the subject. For the workshop, we adapted and abstracted crops from an Ansel Adams work to produce base drawings for the day's work. These representations were abstracted to be reacted to and acted upon by workshop teams via text and graphic manipulation. Centered around the construction of a collective message with visual and written representations of environment, workshop attendees balance discussion and making throughout the day. Discussion intermingled with the transformation of these base representations through acts of making. As you see here, people working directly by hand, um, adding text, etc. Teams soon diverged in terms of how to reconstruct a representation of environment, discussion leading to analogous actions. In one finished workshop representation, the abstracted two-dimensional representation is transformed into a more three-dimensional fabric. In this, the collective message quasi three-dimensional representation of environment and the tactile presence of the human hand coexist. This leads to a representation activated by and activating the ambient conditions, in this case light. 
another group explored how we visualize environment transforming a two d representation into a time based piece of atmosphere and growth and what you see in the background is a film version, a still from the film version in which they re reshot the representation of landscape as kind of a oscillating image. Finally, the third group focused on discussions around the ongoing human and non-human construction of environment. They used a weave of environmental imagery as both analogous artifact and something people could play with and interact act with during, during the day. And we'll conclude back to Leslie. Thanks, Chris, and thanks, Adam. Um, as you can probably imagine, it's been a real delight to collaborate with both of these um, big brains over the past year, and I'm looking forward to the couple years we have ahead of us. Um, we have stayed in close touch with Tim Morton since uh, he's returned to Rice University, and I reached out to him by text the other day and asked if he would comment on his experience of ecopoesis and what he was thinking about around the workshop, and this is what he wrote. We are and we're always, always doing ecopoesis, and the trouble is we are doing it unconsciously. Blake says that a religion is a poem that people start believing in, and we've been subjected to all kinds of religions about what the so-called natural world is. It's an inert object, you can manipulate it, Ecopoesis is the most important architectural project I've seen right now, and I get around. I hesitate to say on the planet because I don't know the whole planet, but now that I've hesitated, let's say it, ecopoesis has planetary significance. So of course we were very thrilled with that generous uh, comment on, on this work, which really wouldn't have been possible without um, you know, Tim's beautiful spirit that he brought, brought to the event. And so the obvious questions for all of us is, what's next, right? What, what are we gonna do in 2020? So we've started that already this past weekend. We went on a five and a half mile walk around San Pedro Point, which is south of here. And then we gathered for a beautiful vegetarian homemade meal and uh, talked about poetry. And we talked about our responses to the walk. We walked with intention. Uh, we also are really excited that the collective vocabulary is there as an archive for us to um, continue to participate in, contribute to, and we invite you to contribute to it as well. It's a living document. Um, in addition, we're offering our first Ecopoesis graduate seminar at California College of the Arts this fall, and I'm going to be leading it and teaching it, and both uh, Adam and Chris will come in as guest lecturers and talk about their specific work, um, you know, their specific design work. So we'll also be messaging 2019 in the fall through our 1111 Literary Magazine, which is available online, which is going to be devoted to ecology, so um, there'll be more images there and more commentary from the participants. And we'll get to work with thinking about uh, the April 2020 event and again, select a person or two to, to come and join us that way. I mean, we, we, I think we were all really thrilled with how uh, warm and gracious and generous everybody was with their time. Uh, what I often say is the older I get, the more grateful I am for people's time. People gave us a day and a half of their time. It was beautiful. And then with that, I wanted to see, Adam, did you want to, um, you know, do you have some comments you wanted to add? Um, I would, one thing I would, I would kind of, re reflecting on the event and thinking about it a month later, um, I recognize the kind of, both the value and the immense um, effort that required to do these kinds of interdisciplinary collaborations. I think a lot of, many institutions, most institutions, ours included, um, uh, like to celebrate that opportunity um, of different disciplines, different programs, different faculty from, from different areas coming together and working together. Um, and the reality is it's rare and difficult to do, um, but highly rewarding. Um, and I think that's one thing that I've, I've been thinking about as we, as we move the project forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Chris? Well, I, I think what I gathered was that we were able to construct something which took advantage of the amazing voices in the Bay Area. Um, and we found that people from technology, people from SFMOMA, people from the Park Service were more than eager to share their time with it and be involved with it. And I think what everyone found is that it takes 
more than one discipline, more than one expertise, more than one voice to begin to express and, and discuss what the stories are of the current era. And I think uh, Ecopoesis was a small example of, of that being shared. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think also one of the things we've seen as well is that we, we carefully curated each little group, right? So they, they were three subgroups. We made sure there were representations across disciplines in each group. And what we're seeing is that these new relationships have formed across people at different institutions and in different verticals, whether it is, you know, like a, with the Park Service or UC Davis or what have you. And, and people are already, this has really kind of fomented a really fascinating, you know, like network of, of conversations about what, what's next, what might be possible. And people have been suggesting beautiful things like we should all go to Alcatraz and do something there. So it's feeding us, I just think, in these really marvelous ways. Uh, and I, I wanted to just wrap up by saying we are really interested in helping other um, academics and community groups um, get involved with ideas about ecopoesis in their schools or communities. We're happy to come to your school or community and talk about how we put this together. As we, we've all kind of laughed about it, this became, <laughs> this was a lot, a, many more hours of meetings than we originally had thought. However, now that we've done all of that work, it would be beautiful to share it with, with other people because I think we did find some great, great ways of organizing people. So thank you so much thank for you. being with us today. And our, our emails are on the, on the deck and get in touch. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.